there's a new type of systemic racism, one much more subtle than in the past. Policies are purpose made to apply equally, but in effect, through practice, they create these huge inequalities. Today, we're going to learn more about the cultural differences and how certain policies and practices disproportionately affect certain groups. We'll also learn practices from the United Nations Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination, or UN CERD. It provides measures to combat discrimination. Um, so what do, we, what do we mean by this? So what we're saying is that a lot of policies that exist are built with the purpose to apply to everyone equally. Seems fair on the surface, but if you look at how it affects different groups in practice, you will, you will see that there is a, a big difference. Um, so examples uh, listed by UN CERD, including uh, police targeting minorities as possible criminal subjects based solely on their race or ethnicity, uh, a 1998 study of uh, police stop and search patterns in England and Wales by the British government's uh, home office found that blacks were 7.5 times more likely to be stopped and searched than whites. In a two-year period in the United uh, U.S. state of Maryland, uh, blacks constituted 79.2% of the drivers stopped and searched by police on the Interstate 95, even though they only constituted 17.5% of the drivers who were violating traffic laws. The war on drugs in the U.S. is waged overwhelmingly against black Americans. For example, although there are more white drug offenders than black in the United States, Blacks constitute 62.7% of all drug offenders sent to state prison. And black men are sent to prison on drug charges at 13.4 times, 13.4 times the rate of white men. Aboriginal people in Australia are 9.2 times more likely to be arrested, 24 times more likely to be imprisoned as an adult and 48 times more likely to be imprisoned as juveniles than non-aboriginals. Um, this it doesn't just apply to um, the belief, well, it also applies to use of, of force. Uh, and it may vary between race or suspect, but in Brazil, darker skinned uh, people shot by the police are almost twice as likely to be killed than whites shot by the police. Uh, the lethality, they call it the lethality index or the ratio of people killed to people wounded in intentional shootings uh, for black and brown skinned people shot in the favelas was a, about 9% compared to a white lethality index of uh, 4.63, about half. So we can see many examples of this. Like I probably don't need to go into, into too much details of, of this. But how? How do we fight racism in policy? Well, the UN CERD recommends that new laws must not discriminate either in purpose of or in effect, meaning that even if a law is made with the purpose of applying to everyone, its effect could disproportionately affect minorities or marginalized communities. So how do you do this? The first step is to collect anonymous data on racist or xenophobic incidents. So record the incidents. Require authorities to publicly publish these anonymized incidents. Then review this anonymized data and undertake necessary corrective actions to address the discrimination that's found. Then have a civilian review board monitor the conduct of policy enforcement. Is this new policy, is it working? Is it being enforced? How well is it working? Let's not judge ourselves based on that. And then provide prompt and effective remedies for victims of discrimination. Of course, um, they also recommend introducing training to combat racial discrimination in practice, 
and their recommendation is to abolish the death penalty. If you look at the comments from educators, Education Week stated that many educators support to one degree or another culturally relevant teaching and other strategies to make schools feel safe and supportive for all students and underserved populations. As one teacher educator put it, uh, the way we usually see any of this in a classroom is have I thought about how my black kids feel or my aboriginal kids feel? And have I made a space for them so that they can be successful? Uh, that's the level I think it stays at for most teachers. So trying to apply this to education is not easy. Um, and so when it comes to uh, disrupting implicit racial bias, uh, here are some recommendations from the United States Department of Education, which I looked at and I really liked because it, it kind of uh, levels the playing field specifically for education policy. So their recommendations are the following. One, have universal screening for giftedness to eliminate bias. Uh, and of course, increase access to AP and IB courses where they do not currently exist, because otherwise only certain students are going to be eligible for IB AP programs. The, the second recommendation is that zero tolerance policies should be banned outright, we should not allow zero tolerance policies. That this lack of tolerance is part of the, the problem is it, this lack of tolerance gets applied discriminatorily. It doesn't, it, some people get some zero tolerance and some people get some tolerance. The third is schools should discourage suspensions and expulsions for more subjective infractions such as willful defiance. So willful defiance um, for a lot of schools is a uh, like a suspendable offense, but they're suggesting like th we should discourage this because there's a lot of people who will do this because they, they feel like they're standing up, you know, for their own personal rights. And so this isn't helping. This is this is marginalizing a group of people. Uh, invest in the professional development for the use of restorative justice to create a safe space for the accused and to make amends amicably. I think that's really key. I, I've read a lot about uh, restorative justice, and I, I really believe that restorative justice is a much more powerful method than using strict discipline when it comes to uh, corrective action. I know people are like, I don't have time for this, but the reality is you'll, you'll end up making more time uh, overall simply because it doesn't solve the problem. It, it deals with an effect of the problem, but like getting to the root cause, you, you need restorative justice to get to that point. The next is to adopt trauma-informed approaches to discipline. So instead of asking what's wrong, we can ask like, we can ask, sorry, instead of asking what's wrong with you, we can ask, well, what's wrong? And so it, there isn't like kind of the, it, like it, it triggers that person's trauma again. Um, and this is, this is a, a really good one. I love this idea of really understanding trauma deeply and understanding how some of our actions can trigger that type of trauma. Because when it comes to an actual incident, we're not going to be thinking about this. The next is to improve practices for recruiting and retaining more educators of color and culturally competent professional development. So have more role models is their recommendation. The next recommendation is to incentivize and support educators in developing and using culturally relevant curricula. If they're going to use something that's culturally relevant, how can we support them? How can we incentivize um, educators for using that? And the next was to expose students to diverse role models and create a safe space for them uh, to celebrate their differences. And I remember uh, when I was the chair for the Saint, the Blessed Marie Rose School, one of the things that we suggested was a cultural night, a cultural activity. We would all get together. Uh, we would celebrate our cultures together. We would have certain things like presentations that we would do. The whole school could be involved. 
uh, it was a fun way to to give some options to celebrate culture. And I think that there, there are ways that we can do this that enrich the experience for every student. Now, one other book that I'm going to recommend is Push Out uh, by Monique Morris, because I think that um, this particular book uh, really covers some of the key aspects of what the racialized experience uh, feels like. Uh, she says that Maya Angelou was raped when she was eight years old and um, was an unwed teen mother. And she found her life changed when she found a teacher who did not practice zero tolerance. Uh, who And this one teacher that didn't practice the zero tolerance policy totally changed her life trajectory. Uh, in March 2012, President Obama showed extraordinary empathy when he said that if he had a son, that son would have looked like Trayvon Martin. I love this quote. Uh, in her book, Monique says, when black girl energy is uncontainable, we can jump with them and dance with them. When the world is painful, we can scream with our girls, not at them. If the world weighs heavy on them, we can teach them to write, and we can sit and write with them. We can have longer conversations and longer tempers. We can let them lead and question and thrive. As educators, there will be times where we must push hard. We can push our girls to fulfill their unique promise, the brilliance, and their capacity for greatness. Uh, she also explained a number of statistics. Um, this is similar to what I've, I've talked about, like uh, the purpose versus the effect. Uh, the reality is the majority of girls in prison are of color. Uh, a large portion, some estimate about 40% identify as LGBTQ. 48% uh, of black girls who are expelled nationwide do not have access to educational services. Uh, black girls are 16% of the female student population uh, but only represent a third of girls referenced, referred to law enforcement, and a third of all arrests at, at schools. So 16%, but like 33%, you know, is, is the amount that they represent in terms of actual arrests um, at schools, and those refer to law enforcement. Zero tolerance policies and exclusionary disciplines uh, like prison or calming rooms is the most common method used. So this for a lot of people is reminding them of where they came from. So during the slave era uh, in the United States, learning to read and write was a crime uh, for black slaves punishable by beatings. It was the 1954 Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court ruling that ended segregation in schools. Uh, among the black community, there are two polarizing categories for girls, good girls and ghetto girls. Ghetto girls are those who do not conform to the white middle class definition of femininity. 25% of black women live in poverty. The unemployment rate for black women aged 20 and over at the end of 2014 was 8% compared to just 4% for white women and 5% for all women. In 2012, black women earned 89% of what uh, white or black men earned. And only 64% of what white men earned. Sorry, uh, black women earned. Black women are also uh, disproportionately employed in language occupations, jobs that pay them less than 21000 per year. Uh, they're also three times more likely to be imprisoned uh, than white women. And one in 19 black women will be incarcerated at some point in her lifetime. So lots of like stats about how things get applied very differently. But the key is like the prioritization of these high stakes testing disproportionately affects uh, black girls who struggle to perform well on such tests, which are crucial for the advancements in school or graduation. And so as a result, they they have the lowest high school graduation rates at 59%. Uh, unemployment uh, was 14, no, 15%. Uh, 
while it was 8% for whites and 10% for Latinos. Um, so to improve these conditions in schools, we should use a race conscious gender analysis of our policies. We should redefine respect and how disciplinary policies uniquely impact certain cultures. Just look at the student teacher relationships. Dress code policies are often subjectively enforced and assumptions are made about the sexuality of individuals uh, based on the, their dress. So have a candid talk uh, with girls about sexism and patriarchy in our society and focus on transformation rather than punishment. Uh, they describe, like, you don't want teachers describing, um, or you don't want students describing their teachers as like something that they're scared to approach or that they're worried that the teacher is going to ask them to leave the classroom. Um, they also want somebody to check in with them more often. And of course, they, they wish they had a class on how to get a job. 